Good afternoon. Um, my name's Ian Morgan. I'm an advisor in property finance and infrastructure finance uh, based in London, but I've spent a lot of time in Central and Eastern Europe. Firstly, before we get going too far on the conversation about reconstruction in Ukraine, um, it's worth taking a moment to acknowledge the, um, the men and women of the Ukrainian Armed Forces without whose sacrifice and bravery, none of this conversation about uh, the future reconstruction for Ukraine would, 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 would uh, make any sense. So um, with that said, um, as everyone here knows, uh, even the people from across the ocean, um, the full-scale Russian in invasion of Ukraine has, has triggered uh, huge shockwaves throughout Europe and, and the world. Um, it's the first large-scale land war, obviously, since uh, World War II. It's triggered nine million displaced people inside and, and outside of Ukraine, and the demographic impact of that uh, can be felt here in Warsaw for sure. Um, according to the World Bank, the economic damage is at last tally $500 billion, and the, the meter is still running on that. Um, and yet, the Ukrainian economy is still growing. Uh, there's a GDP growth after a big hit in 2022. Um, and um, the real estate sector is still moving. Transactions are happening, as you'll hear about from, from, from Olga's presentation. Um, and uh, we're at the, at the cusp of one of the biggest real estate reconstruction uh, opportunities probably in our lifetimes. Um, and so with that, um, I'd like to introduce um, uh, Olga Balitska from, from PwC Kyiv, who's the uh, real estate partner there. She's going to give us a bit of an overview on, on the sector, and then we'll bring the panel on, and, and, uh, and then at the end we'll have uh, time for some Q&A. Thank you very much, colleagues, and uh, thank you, Ian, for this introduction. We are really grateful for the armed forces of Ukraine. I think all of us, not only Ukrainians, but all of us who are here, who are protecting our borders, our souls, our children, and our businesses from the aggression worldwide. Uh, so basically, uh, I will go on with the start of, our, of my presentation. I was coming to this conference today from the upper floor here and uh, was listening to CNN, Amanpour. You know, she has a question to our uh, minister. Is Ukraine failing? And he told, not at all. We are not failing. We are moving forward. And different battlefield, we can discuss this issue because we are moving back and forth like the war is going on. It's definitely true towards the Ukrainian economy. You will not be expect. Here's some information general about Ukraine, where we are located, but you will not expect such figures, such numbers, and such uh, slides with respect to Ukrainian economy during the war. It's unprecedented that we had GDP growth by 5.3% in 2023. It is predicted to be still growth in 2024 and even more in 25 and 26. We have an uh, inflation laid, uh, rate only of 8.2% with grievous uh, devaluation, and it will be even decreased in the next few years. Most important, and you will not see on this slide, but you will definitely see if you attend the Ukrainian, uh, Ukraine dedicated panel, that we have more than 85% of Ukrainian business who resumed their operations or never stopped their operations during the war. Only 3% of Ukrainian business is closed permanently. The rest of business is functioning. How we are doing that? Because we are getting adapted. We are getting adapted with innovations. We are getting adapted with full digitalization of all the processes. More than 500 processes you can access online. You can register your company online. You can pay taxes online. You can pay fines online. We have all the set of our documents in uh, such app is called DIA, where we've got everything starting from licenses, driving licenses, passports, etc. So everything in Ukraine is digitalized these days, so it's easily accessible, and business getting adapted. And here I'm coming a little bit further. What I wanted to tell in the end, 
Yes, uh, I was thinking about how to compare war to the time and to the challenges we're all facing in this room. Maybe we can compare it to the COVID times. You know, what were our thoughts at the beginning of the COVID? Oh, we all will die, the business will not survive, we don't know how to live further. The same thing happened to us in Ukraine. But after that, we've got adapted. So the business is functioning, we are still functioning, we are developing, we are developing new areas, and that is the right time to jump in. What is the second reason for the right time to jump in? I will show you on the next slide. Here are. We are all dependent on the finance. We are all dependent on money, and we go where the money go. Despite the huge development in the sectors and growth in certain areas of real estate, we have some assistance and you can see which kind of pouring uh, financial disbursements we had in 2024 as of today, 11.8 billion. Some of them go to military, some of them go to governmental assistance, but what is important today? We've got to prove Ukrainian facility, EU assistance program for Ukraine for $50 billion. Pay attention to the second pillar, it's Ukraine investment framework, which already had started and was activated. It's about 6.97 billion, which will go to private sector, mostly, to support projects in Ukraine. And here it presents substantial opportunity. We will have my colleague panelists from EBRD and uh, our top investment officer, our ex but still available from Ukrainvest, who will tell you more about that and how to jump into. Pros of investing in Ukraine, you can see definitely on uh, this slide. Ukraine is future member for you, uh, so uh, we estimate the period to get and realistically is about seven years. In seven years, we can see that we will be able to join the EU with all the opportunities and advantages. We have rebuilding related investment opportunities uh, and uh, uh, approximately 5 billion US uh, needed for Ukraine recovery and hopefully we will get them. Geographical positions, significant raw material based digitalization of our, all our governmental services leading expert investment opportunities and war risk insurance, which is already successfully functioning in Ukraine. Ukraine recovery finances and anti-corruption initiatives. Uh, the most important slide here, very fair slide. I will tell you very fair slide, the cons of investing in Ukraine. I will jump to the to those ones, and you will see it's uh, written down changing. I was preparing this presentation a month ago, and since that, there are already changes. Curving street restrictions for paying dividends to non residents, huh? It's changing. About three weeks ago, National Bank of Ukraine passed new regulation which are allow allowing payment of dividends to a certain extent and allowing uh, uh, currency circulations in Ukraine and it comes to more and more liberalization. Traditional restriction on certain sectors for foreign investments let market. You know, uh, uh, it's very political consideration, but as of today, a land, agricultural land in Ukraine was allowed for purchase only to Ukrainian citizens after it was allowed uh, to Ukrainian legal entities. And right now there are discussions with EU. If we join EU, we would need to uh, eliminate those restrictions and we need to somehow give equal access to all the players to land market in Ukraine. And definitely it will boost uh, agri-sales and agri-sector development. Promising areas for Ukraine. I will also go very briefly. You can uh, find much more information on our breakout sessions for Ukraine with data collected and with all the incentives of the market. And this presentation will also be shared with you so that you can have a, a look. Promising area is definitely logistics. Uh, uh, we uh, we have. Uh, uh, 
very uh, uh, huge opportunities for logistic development, especially in uh, modern and uh, class A logistic sector, warehouses uh, where uh, the demand is definitely high. The vacancy rate uh, approximately all over Ukraine is 1% for logistic. So, and it's, uh, uh, it's very diversified between the quality of the logistics of the warehouses. So basically those of high quality, they have zero vacancy and waiting list. The others are definitely had uh, a shortage of customers. Uh, residential and hospitality problem, uh, projects are also uh, uh, quite well developing in Ukraine, especially in the areas like central and western Ukraine. Uh, industrial parks and technic parks due to special conditions for uh, setting up and special tax preferences and uh, support from the states uh, rapidly developing. Land market, as I told, it will be further expanding and developing. And the very important thing, industrial production of construction materials, recycling of uh, construction waste, green materials where we are still going despite the war. These are the promising sectors and very much needed. With respect to construction materials, I would emphasize still on glass production. We definitely have shortage of glass, and uh, that is, is a very promising area. Here are specific preferences for investors, and uh, I will not stop much on that about industrial parks. We can discuss further. There is an interesting so-called investment nanny's law, which guarantees state support to the project of over 12 million investment in Ukraine nowadays. So you will be granted, if you come to Ukraine, you will be granted so-called investment nanny, someone who will s help you to navigate Ukrainian bureaucracy. And by the way, there will be tangible support of about 30% uh, capex, with exemptions from uh, certain taxes, land allotment, uh, energy supply provision, etc. Industrial parks, here is some information how you can work with that. And void political in risk insurance, it is already functioning in Ukraine. It is important. But the most important thing to understand that we've got used and Ukrainian business and foreign business who is coming to Ukraine, we got used to war. Is the risk of your premise, of your uh, facilities to be demolished by the war, especially in Central and Western Ukraine, is quite low still. So basically you get adapted and it becomes like, you know, like fire in your building. So business get adapted and we get adapted to work in such realities, even without war and political risk insurance, but still we have it. Where should invest ahead? And here's the last slide in my presentation, but the most important one. Here are, is the information about public sector projects, where you can find projects, where you can find information, what is there on the table, where can you jump in literally tomorrow. But here, one, one sentence is missing. The first thing I would really suggest everyone to do and really consider after this conference, find reliable Ukrainian partner. That is the most important thing who, who can spell, help you to understand Ukrainian market today, who can help you how to navigate, who can advise on the preferences and advantages of each sector, who can advise on location. And that is important. And uh, just, you can also head here, we will help you with everything. And just important thing, the last but not the least. Uh, today is the momentum for Ukraine. Sooner you come, sooner you look at the market, more benefits you're gonna get. It is challenging, definitely, but nothing is not challenging in the world. The world will never be the same, and the world will never be safe. Everyone in this room has survived COVID-19. You will definitely need 
to try to look at this new location, attractive market, and f to get further benefits for yourself. More you invest today in Ukraine, sooner we have the victory, sooner we have survival, and sooner we have the better world. So you are covered with all the angles. Thank you very much. And I hope we will go further with other panelists into like discussion and ready to answer your questions. You're welcome. Okay, so we have a great panel today. Um, I'll give a quick, quick intro, but I'll let the panelists introduce themselves. We have Oleg Fidulin from EBRD, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. Uh, we have Sergei Tsivkach from Chicago Atlantic Trident, uh, formerly also of Ukraine Invest. Uh, we have Mike uh, Stenson from um, Kingspan, so far the biggest FDI project in Ukraine that's been announced. And of course, Olga, who just gave us a great presentation uh, on the overview. So let's start with uh, um, Oleg. Do you want to tell us a bit about yourself and what you do at uh, EBRD? Thank you, Jan. Uh, I mean, the bank is a development bank. I'm sure the name is pretty well known, but I'm not sure how well it is known in the YDC context. So I will just start with that uh, very briefly. <laughs> Um, and also in the context of specifically real estate, we, I'm from property and tourism team. I have been with the bank for 12 years, uh, based in London. My sector, sorry, my country focus is the Baltic states, Ukraine, and certain CE markets. And in CE, we mostly focused on logistics and the living sector. And it would be fair to say that in uh, the region we've done, uh, I mean, we've cooperated with, let's say, many large platforms, uh, CTP, WDP, VGP in logistics, and Poland in the living sector. It's a kind of a new, plus a new exposure for us. Um, I mean, uh, Rezi for Rent, Live Sport, and their competitors, also Heimstaden in Czech Republic uh, last year. Um, in terms of uh, what we do, we have no limitations in terms of sectors uh, commercial, of commercial real estate. Yes, uh, logistics and living sector I mean, have been the focus uh, in the past years. Uh, and product-wise, we are mostly known as a senior debt provider, but we, we also co-invest, taking large stake minority positions, doing joint ventures, and also we invest in funds, uh, property funds. In uh, Ukraine, uh, the bank has deployed uh, since uh, the start of the large-scale war uh, close to 4 billion euro. Most of that was a combination of sovereign and private sector. In real estate, I have to say we close only one project, a joint venture with uh, Dragon Capital. It's a development, uh, we took a minority 35% uh, stake in a development project in Lviv uh, to develop a multi-stage modern warehouse complex. And uh, currently we're looking at, um, uh, let's say, various pipeline projects. And the focus would be mostly logistics and uh, residential. And I'm happy to explore that later, why those two sectors and what we see there. That's true. Uh, Sidhi, what's, um what can you tell us about Chicago Atlantic and, uh, and, uh, and maybe rewind a little bit on Ukraine Invest. Um, but, yeah. Thank you very much for inviting to be part of this uh, conference. It's a, a great honor and privilege to be here. So um, I have been the head of Ukraine Invest for the last four years, three, three years and uh, eight months. That's the Ukraine's government investment support and, and promotion office. In December 2023, I have joined uh, Chicago Atlantic uh, as managing partner in Ukraine for its strategy called Chicago Atlantic Trident. So the strategy is to invest in real estate, uh, real estate meaning affordable housing, uh, industrial processing and in industrial real estate. So we are at the very active stage of looking for projects. We will be investing beginning this year. We are not waiting till the end of the war. Chicago Atlantic as investment firm uh, deployed uh, around $2.5 billion of investments in the US, current AUM over $1.3 billion, and we are building kind of well, a big sub substantial investment strategy uh, for Ukraine to invest in those sectors that I have already mentioned, and we expect good cooperation with DFIs, IFIs, private investors, and of course, companies on the ground and foreign companies that are interested to do investments in Ukraine in hard assets. So I would say we are probably 
new player on the market that is ready to invest in hard assets. And I don't see any other players that are doing this right now in Ukraine. So we are, can easily say that we are champions uh, at this moment. Thank you. Mike, tell us a bit about Kingspan and, and, and yourself. Um, so I'd echo what um, Sergey said in terms of um, being very privileged to be here today. Um, I've worked for Kingspan for 18 years or so in a variety of operations, uh, innovation, and created the whole innovation area for the group, and now managing this big project that we're investing in, in Ukraine. The, um, not sure how many people know the Kingspan Group. We're an Irish uh, headquartered producer of building materials with a specific focus on energy efficient, lower carbon uh, insulation, typically, um, that's used in warehouses, logistics centers, and many industrial and commercial properties across the world. Um, we've eight factories actually here in Poland, um, and we're going to build six in Ukraine. Uh, we've 22,000 employees and more than 250 manufacturing sites across the world. So we're a big, big player in the whole um, uh, building materials uh, space around insulation. We're organized into six divisions, and each of those divisions will have a facility in uh, Western Ukraine. Do you want me to talk about that right now? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, uh, we made a decision a couple of years ago for capacity reasons, capacity growth reasons in Eastern Europe to uh, build a manufacturing campus in Western Ukraine. And we chose Western Ukraine um, because of you know, the opportunities that we see in the future, um, as well as the possibility of exporting back into um, the rest of Eastern Europe. Um, we took that decision you know, while the war was going on. Um, so it's obviously a little bit more riskier than if we'd gone for a safer option someplace else. But we took, we've taken a long-term uh, view of that. So the plan we have is for a 50-hectare site um, near the city of Lviv. Um, and basically, my job is to make that happen and realize the project over the next, you know, between two and six or seven years. We have a project team of designers, uh, architects, cost managers, uh, working away, finalizing design development plans, et cetera, et cetera. And we hope to get started uh, by the end of this year. Now, because of the circumstances that are there, we have to take an internal decision uh, in terms of you know, the risk profile that's associated with that. And we'll make that decision by the end of this year. Uh, we, you know, we've made that decision because we see tremendous opportunities um, for the use of building materials, both inside and outside Ukraine. Uh, and we have a long history, let's say, of doing that in, in many countries in this part of the world. Um, the key for us is we want to be ready to produce in factories when the war finishes. And by definition, then, that means we're going to have to take some calculated risks of, perhaps of building something that doesn't exist there before the war um, finishes. But and that's going to be part of the decision process that we're going to have to evaluate uh, over the next uh, six to nine months. Mike, can you give us a sense of this? So 50 hectares is pretty big. Can you give us a sense of the scale of the investment that's, that's being contemplated by Kingspan? Yeah, it has got to come to it. It's a 300 million US dollars um, over a six, seven year uh, period. Uh, I, I should say that our insulated panel division, one of our six divisions for logistics centers and uh, warehouses and cold store stuff has had a sales office in Lviv since 2005. So we have a good bit of knowledge uh, through importation. Uh, we're absolutely convinced, though, there's massive opportunities for the private sector, assuming the financing, financing commitments that uh, my colleague here uh, talked about. The good news is that for us is that most of the standards that are there in building materials and building construction comply w already with EU rules and regulations, which is, which is interesting. As I said, the total investment will be in the region 300 million US dollars. Um, we are participating in that investment nanny program that was on the presentation <coughs> earlier. Uh, and we're working with the government in terms of you know, lots of aspects of that, because it's, it's, it's new. Um, we see you know, Ukraine is open for business. Um, it is, yes, it is, it is an additional risk, but there's also tremendous opportunities. It does go without saying that there are some significant challenges of investing there currently. Uh, there, there are four in particular. One, one is you know, staff shortages. Some of that is driven by the military um, mobilization and, and stuff like that, and, and that's a reality. 
um, and we just have to work our way through that. The second one in terms of investment is there is a distinct lack of what I would call serviced sites. You know, I, I think I'm correct in saying that, you know, agricultural land is, you know, has the pri is, is primary in Ukraine. And therefore, we've had, a, you know, a, a, more difficulties than we'd have liked, but we got there at the end in terms of finding, a, finding land and finding a way of getting it zoned and all that stuff. And, and there's a particular process that you've got to go through. So the planning process is cumbersome, difficult, bureaucratic, but it's, it's, it's quite well defined, actually. You know, in terms of, you just got to follow it. And of course, um, the ongoing military risk from drones and missiles, right, is, is something we have to be always uh, cognizant of. Um, so two of those four issues relate to the war, and two relate to, you know, whether the war is there or not, right, in relation to planning and in relation to um, serviced sites for development. The site we have acquired has no services of anything. It's a field, effectively, right? So we have separate side projects with power, road, rail, water, sewage, and gas all going on in parallel with the main project, and uh, we'll do that. But we remain absolutely committed and enthusiastic to make this happen. As I said, $300 million investment happened between now and probably the end of 2030. Great. Um, Olga, can you talk to us speaking, you know, so following on Mike's comments about land, um, just to give a bit of context on the land market, because that's been changing quite dramatically over the past couple of years. Uh, yes, I was speaking about Agriland, because Agriland, there was moratorium on sale of Agriland till uh, five years ago. So actually, I was a winner with, with the company on the European Court for Human Rights to, for opening of moratorium. Later on, it was opened uh, for Ukrainian citizens, adapted that for Ukrainian legal entities, and probably agri-land market might be open to some kind of foreign element. But apart from agricultural land, uh, all the other types of land, for example, for construction purposes, for anything, they can be owned either by Ukrainian companies and by foreign companies. And the issue with rezoning that you were raising right now, it's actually quite a vivid one, and I think in every country to get proper zoning of your land plot, it's quite an issue. But even that being developed, yesterday I was commenting the new law on uh, facilitation of rezoning for certain construction purposes. So even the rezoning of the land plots is rapidly changing. Yes, it could be a challenge. That's why we are speaking about Ukrainian partner or Ukrainian consultant who can help you with pop properly cleaning the land plot you want to construct on. But still, there is a possibility to do that. And uh, if you communicate and cooperate, it's quite, quite easy. Yeah, I, mean, I, I, I may just jump in there if I can and say, you know, we, we had to go through all that process of creating a, a, um, a Ukrainian registered entity separate to the one we already have there and go through all that process in terms of, and then working with, I mean, we appointed a, a third party to manage the whole um, rezoning process with the local authorities. Uh, and the land we acquired was from, if you like, state land, right? But that was agriculture and again, went through a process, took a lot longer than we had anticipated, but you know, we've come out the other end of it and ready to. And actually, I, just last sentence, you did, you followed the longest and the hardest process. So you still manage it because with private land, it's much easier, etc. So you sure. did it, thank you. Can I switch, um, Sergei? Um, Chicago Atlantic, real estate private equity firm, uh, you could invest globally. Um, what were the arguments and, the, and the, the key points about the Ukrainian market that brought the fund and the firm to, to Ukraine? Well, first of all, um, Chicago Atlantic is building impact investment strategy. The idea is to support Ukraine during these difficult times and to invest money in something that would have a significant impact for the country, for the region, and I mean for the whole world, because we need to prove that you know, this full-scale military aggression is something that is, you know, was initiated against democracy. And when democracy is being attacked, so the rest of the democratic countries, they have to step on board and protect the country and then help to rebuild the country. And by doing so, we'll be doing good, I mean, to the world. So this is about kind of emotional side of things. 
Now, going to practical side of things, investable, inv investment uh, side of uh, this activity. Uh, Ukraine has solid and very strong chances of becoming a EU member. This may happen in three, five, seven years. You know, we will see. So the latest statement by EU politicians was that Ukraine will be joining uh, EU around 2030. Our fund is a long-term strategy. So investing now in Ukraine will help develop the country, but also will increase our profits upon uh, joining the EU system, you know, because that would increase the cost of uh, assets uh, in Ukraine. Also, uh, we are quite certain that uh, there will be a need to develop a private equity market in Ukraine more heavily. We don't have many players, private equity uh, players in Ukraine. So that is linked to the readiness of Ukrainian projects, sometimes low readiness to be uh, invested in. So we are happy to work with Ukrainian companies in order to uh, develop their understanding how to work with international financial system and private equity specifically. The cost of rebuilding of Ukraine according, according to the latest World Bank's estimation is around 500 billion. But we think in Ukraine, government and experts, that this figure is very close to one trillion, maybe more. So we will not be able to draw all this money only from state resources, DFIs, IFIs, or even Russian assets. We need to have access to private capital. And this is where jumping into the kind of almost unlimited pool of financial resources that may be available to the country. But Private capital is the most, uh, I mean, sensitive capital in terms of investment strategy. So private capital would, will only go to the country where it will feel safe. So I think it's also part of our mission, jointly with DFIs, with Ukrainian government, with businesses that are entering Ukraine, to make our market more sustainable, welcoming, and predictable, as well as, well as transparent for international private capital. It's a great segue into the DFI and EBRD conversation. Uh, Oleg, what, uh, how is the bank going to work with uh, the private sector, you know, the, people, the kind of people in this room? Uh, what sort of structures, what sort of products are envisioned for, uh, for the Ukrainian market? Thank you, Jan. A fantastic question, by the way. And what Sergei said, also fully second that. Um, speaking about purely real estate, for us, it's 100% private sector. We don't have, actually, we have very few somehow state-connected projects when, when it comes to real estate. And for Ukraine, that's uh, the same story. I mentioned uh, as our priority sectors, uh, logistics, uh, housing, and maybe as a secondary priority, regional shopping centers. So that would be focus uh, for us. Uh, but there is a pipeline, and we work hard to, let's say, materialize uh, that pipeline. It's, uh, I mean, it's a difficult process because there is war and, uh, I mean, financial situation and those things. But we have a broad mandate, and we can get behind strong sponsors with strong projects. So, I mean, because it's private sector, it has to make sense commercially. It's mm -hmm. not just, let's say, I mean, let's build something. It's not a field of dreams kind of situation. It has to have of, let's say, viable uh, tenant demand. It has to have a market and uh, things like that because we do things bottom up. In that way, we are looking to support uh, platforms that would help us uh, deploy capital at scale. And those platforms could be industrial logistics, those platforms could be housing, and we are working with sponsors who have pipelines. And sure. yes, so in terms of products, uh, just very quickly, uh, our, core, our core product is senior debt, so that would be our starting point. But recognizing challenges uh, that we see, not surprisingly, probably, our first deal was actually joint venture investment with a local partner. So and, that and, and that's a yeah. sort of market standard LTV of what kind of uh, level? I mean, the deal we closed, it's an equity investment. So we took 35% stake. From a senior debt perspective, I would probably see it difficult to go beyond 50% loan to value mm -hmm. now. Um, but once again, it's the quality of the sponsor, quality of the project, and it has to have, let's say, a strong commercial backbone. Sure. And there are projects like that, I have to say. It's not wishful thinking. Okay. In line with 
a comment about the quality of the sponsor. Said he, what, what do you, how do you think about finding operating partners for, for your fund, for Chicago Atlantic Trident and Chicago Atlantic? How do you sort of filter these opportunities and think about positioning yourself with, with partners in the market? You mean to uh, close the fund or to, uh, to engage other uh, yeah. partners to Ukraine? To deploy, to, to find operating partners in Ukraine that you can work with uh, locally. Well, we are uh, working, well, I was, as I said, I was the head of Ukraine Invest for yep. almost four years. So I pretty much, and the team on the ground and myself, we know Ukraine in and out pretty much, you know, so we know the companies that are operational, we know the companies that are good, we know international players, we welcome them uh, in Ukraine as well. So uh, I don't see any problem, I mean, for us to have a very strong pipeline, and we already have it, yep. you know, so we will not have any shortage of projects, I mean, for the next two to three years to, to invest in. But Ukraine will have to develop this market significantly in order to attract new investment funds, you know, more, you know, also additional players, because they would be looking for projects. And I, I, I have to tell you that when the war will end, there would be an avalanche of requests to enter Ukraine. Right. And there we will have definitely not us, but other companies, shortage of professionals, shortage of projects, and shortage of, uh, you know, uh, Ukrainian companies that are ready and equipped to work according to international standards. So we have to start working on this now. And this is what we do because when we uh, uh, work with Ukrainian companies, we educate them and we show the example how to work according to best standard. And also, we're very much interested, and that's why I'm here today. Thank you to organizers, you know, for the invitation. We're happy to work with any foreign companies that are interested to enter Ukraine, but are not ready to risk capital. So if you are a strong European or any international company that is interested to do industrial project, logistics project, maybe even affordable housing if you are ready to, to do that. So we are ready to co-invest with you to assess potential you know, for this co-investment uh, in order to make you more uh, you know, uh, interested in doing business in Ukraine. So I welcome all uh, you know, uh, suggestions in this regard. And uh, we think that the Ukrainian market is not about the future. It's about Ukraine. Tens of millions of square meters of residential buildings, of administrative buildings, of, you know, all infrastructure in Ukraine was destroyed. The market is not dead. There is a significant decline, but the market is operational. And even housing, you know, the flats have been sold. It's a different market, though. So before Ukrainian system, like if we talk about affordable housing, uh, the system in Ukraine was mainly open to Ukrainian companies. And uh, Ukrainian company would get a land, a kind of plot of land, invest 10% in the project, and then the rest of the project will be self-financed. It's very different now. A lot of money stuck inside of Ukraine due to restrictions to send money to the mother companies abroad. So according to preliminary estimate, about $30 billion can be on accounts of Ukrainians that have nowhere to invest them or how to send them abroad. That's why the market is operational. But people or companies, they are not interested to buy property when it's not complete yet, or not complete for 80 or 90%. So now the companies that do real estate projects in Ukraine, they have to develop the project till 70 or 80% readiness, and then it will be sold. But to do so, you need more equity. So again, it's a good, very good opportunity for equity firms to enter Ukraine, support local develop developers, and then bring product to the market. We have programs like Ye or Sele, it's electronic state mortgage program. So they have a lot of secondary market, but the primary market, newly built flats, they have shortage of that. This, this is like a demand stimulus for housing. Yes. Yeah, so be, ju just because of this, this self-finance exercise. So we will be helping them to build, to build these properties and to put them uh, to the state mortgage program, which is heavily subsidized. In Ukraine, you can get a mortgage now for between 5 to 
APR, you know, so in local currency. So it's a, it's a very good program that is being developed now. Uh, I probably can add to that. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, the residential market is being developed, and uh, it's uh, there are clear regional preferences in Ukraine. So the central part of Ukraine and the western part of Ukraine are here heavily attractive for the development because they are much safer regions, and uh, also because the number of temporary displaced people are going in there. For example, for you to understand, in Kyiv currently, we have extra population of 400,000 people who are displaced from other areas, and how many of them are, are, are capable to buy and to invest because those are from business representatives, etc., which were relocated from uh, Donetsk, uh, Lugansk, and other regions. Uh, another attractive uh, thing about that is that the state is going to finance relocation of people uh, who, whose houses were destroyed to the new buildings. And basically, as there is a system functioning which is called Yevid Novlinya, where this, when you. This is the voucher system, essentially. Yes, voucher system, but you get basically voucher for the property you've lost, and uh, it's uh, the value, the medium value of those vouchers are about, if I'm not mistaken, it's something roughly like uh, uh, 50,000 US dollars. So it's pretty good to value to invest into new houses. It's being developed right now because there is not that much funding for that, but it's being developed. And another area which we probably will, uh, I would like to emphasize, on top of what we were discussing in real estate, how to easily access the market. Uh, right now, literally in a couple of months, a number of arrested and expropriated Russian assets and businesses will be on the market and sale through competitive sales on one of the sites, I, on one of the platform, plus Prozora platform, most probably, will go on privatization. So these are very well-functioning assets, very well-functioning businesses, ready, clean, and ready to go in your hands. So that is basically the thing which should be investigated further and research. I would really suggest, because here's the momentum, about a couple of months they will be in. Um, with that, I'd like to open it up to Q&A. We can also have Q&A in the breakout session at 2.30 or whatever it is. Um, but is there anyone here that wants to shoot one now? Thank you. I'll be quick because I know we're behind for lunch. But it's a question for Sergey. Um, when you, you were in charge of the Investment Promotion Agency at the time, and what I find interesting is in the face of dealing with the, the war, keeping the staff together, all the immediate crises, Ukraine actually pushed ahead uh, with a reform to the investment environment to make it more attractive. Can you just tell a little bit about that? Because I think it's quite interesting and, and relevant in terms of the investment attractiveness of the country. Uh, thank you. Well, just to, to a small comment on Olga's, she's exactly right. And I would uh, bring your attention as a real estate managers to two assets that will be privatized in, in Ukraine now. is the Hotel Ukraine in Maidan Square, immediately in, the, uh, in Kyiv center, and Hotel Kozatsky. These are very interesting assets that will be privatized probably at the cost of its uh, real price. So it's a very good uh, time to, to think about that. Um, uh, yeah, yes, uh, so we have this system that Olga mentioned, investment analysis, so it's not a, it's, it's, it's a kind of a deeper thing. It's the call on state support for investment projects with significant investments. Why we had significant work there? Because initially it was focused on projects for over $100 million. Then it was passed in the parliament and the threshold was decreased to 20 million euros. Uh, when, the work, uh, when the war broke out, uh, in uh, March 2022, uh, we didn't have much investments, obviously, so we, have, we were thinking how to develop the system. And Ukraine Invest drafted initial proposals to decrease threshold and then to make it more flexible for investors based on our practical experience, because we were the responsible for attraction of investors under this scheme. So we drafted a number of uh, significant proposals submitted to the Ministry of Economy, 
uh, to the Prime Minister, thanks to the Ministry of Economy and specifically to the Prime Minister of Ukraine, this initiative was passed then to the Parliament of Ukraine. Uh, voted, signed by the President, and on the 12th of September 2023. Now we have bylaws. So it's a very flexible system now. Three billion grivnias allocated in the budget of Ukraine. This is approximately 80 million uh, dollars, something like that, for reimbursement of investors that will build infrastructure needed for their projects, like electricity, water, gas supply, railway. You build it, and then the state reimburses you if it's not more than 30% of the capex. So that is happening. Now you can start your project in Ukraine and then submit application for investment incentive after the launch of the project, within 18 months. You can also, uh, before this change, we had a requirement to have at least 80 people employed. Now we have 10 people employed, kind of the minimum uh, level, uh, because we realized that 80 people employment would limit attraction of highly technological projects to Ukraine. So we had a project, for example, in Ukrainian West with investment for $160 million, but they only had 16 employees and they wouldn't qualify under this system. So uh, we are, by uh, introducing this law, it's a presidential initiative that is implemented by the government. We are not inventing kind of um, a bicycle or a wheel. We're just trying to be competitive compared to countries in European Union, with Turkey, with uh, other countries. So any country has this incentive. It's a good thing. It's uh, more uh, investor friendly now, but we also need to work on business environment, uh, rule of law, transparency, and being competitive continuously. We need to make sure that we update our regulations on a continuous basis to be competitive. Okay. I realize we're the only thing standing in between you and lunch, and that is not a good position to be in. So if, uh, if there are people that with interest in this, um, I'll put in a plug for our breakout session uh, after lunch at 2.30, I believe. Thank you very much.